Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the West Richmond Church of the Brethren online service for April 19th, 2020. I welcome you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior today. I pray that this finds you well. If you uh, were emailed uh, an email with a bulletin attached to it, I would invite you to uh, download or put it up on your screen so that you may use it in our service. We have a, uh, a responsive read for our call to worship, and there are words for two songs that will be, uh, will be played and, and sung during our time of worship together. So uh, prepare for worship with me this morning as we come together. Amen. Join me in our call to worship. I wait patiently for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. Lead me to your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all day long. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renown are the desires of our hearts. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let us pray. 
Lord Jesus, after death and resurrection, you sent your followers into the world to proclaim your resurrection to the entire world. Send us now into the world to bear witness to all you have done in our lives. Amen. We have time for children now, and um, I've invited Jory to uh, to share a book on waiting. So, if you have kids, gather them around the screen and uh, and hear what uh, what Jory's book has to say about waiting. I'm going to read a book called "Waiting Is Not Easy" by Mo Willems. No, no. Gerald! I have a surprise for you. Yay! What is it? Uh, the surprise is a surprise. Not a sandwich. Oh. Is it big? Yeah. Yes. Is it pretty? Yes. Can we share it? Yes! yes. I cannot wait. You will have to. Yeah, piggy. Wait, what, why? The surprise is not here yet. So I will have to wait for it? No. Yes. Grown. That part of the Oh well, if I have to wait, I will wait. I am waiting. Waiting is not easy. Piggy, I want to see your surprise now. I am sorry, Gerald, but we must wait. Groan! Oof. I am done waiting. I do not think your surprise is worth this waiting. I will not wait anymore. Bye, Gerald. Okay, I will wait some more. It will be worth it. Groan! Don't forget that one. <laughs> <laughs> but. Piggy, we have waited too long. It is getting dark. It is getting darker. Soon, we will not be able to see each other. Soon, we will not be able to see anything. We have wasted the whole day. No, you did not. You well, um... We have waited and waited and waited and waited. And for what? 
for that. What is this? Stars. This beautiful night sky. In the stars. This was worth the wait. Oh. I know. Tomorrow morning, I want to show you the sunrise. I cannot wait. Good morning, friends. Will you join me in a time of prayer? Oh God, this is a hard time, a season of confusion and fear, a season of unanswered questions and an uncertain future. Give us hope, give us steadiness, and give us a reminder of who you are. You are a God of presence, walking alongside us in times of fear and uncertainty. You are a God of promises, answering prayers, sending rainbows after storms, and healing our hearts when we are broken. You are a God of healing, working always to bring our minds, bodies, and spirits into a space of wholeness if we simply allow you to do your work in us. You are a God of resurrection. Use us in these uncertain times to be your heart and hands to others, expressing gratitude for those who are risking their lives to protect us, expressing comfort to those who are struggling with loss and loneliness, and expressing joy in the small things, the needed perspective that these days can bring us. Help us, O oh God, in all ways and in all days to be your church in the world. Amen. Our scripture lesson is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 1, 1 through 11. Hear these words. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day that he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by convincing proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? 
He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set up by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. May God bless the reading of his holy word. I spend a lot of time in my office staring out the window. I appreciate being able to, to see out and see the area, the picnic area and the playground. And if you come in and you see me doing it, you might wonder if I'm actually making the best use of my time. I assure you that I am. These past few weeks of our lockdown, I confess that I spend a lot more time staring out the window at my home. I'm restless. I go from one window to the next because I, I don't know how to preach. Things have escalated so quickly, it's, it's hard for me to get a spiritual handle on things. But it reminds me of this comment found in today's passage. You know, after Jesus ascends and his disciples continue to look up into the heavens, and two men dressed in white, and we presume that they're angels, they ask the disciples, why do you stand there staring up into the heavens? And maybe like me, they're waiting for inspiration. The book of Acts is the second volume of two books written by Luke. The Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts are book one and book two of Luke's writings. Here in the book of Acts, Luke turns his attention from the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus to the beginnings of the Christian church. The story in Acts is the story of the church expanding ever outward uh, from Jerusalem and in increasing circles out to the far edges of the known world, Rome. Acts 1, the passage that we read this morning, is an interlude between Jesus' resurrection and the arrival of the Holy Spirit. It's like an intermission between scene one and scene two. It's like halftime at a basketball game, a time to rest, restore, and prepare for what will follow in the second half. During this interlude, Jesus instructs his disciples. He taught, he taught them about the kingdom of God. He told them to wait in Jerusalem. He assured them that he would be with them in the Holy Spirit. He taught them that they were not to know when he would return and restore the nation of Israel. And finally, that they would be his witnesses. If we were to continue to read through the book of Acts, then you will discover, or we will discover, that after the Holy Spirit's empowering them in chapter two, the church grew at an incredible rate. Only now, meanwhile, they live in this interlude, a time between. There are interludes in our own lives. This pandemic is an interlude of sorts, a time we wait. A time when the wheels of progress come to a grinding halt and forces us all to stop, reflect, spend some time staring out the window. 
Waiting is not an easy exercise, but it is necessary. The Bible speaks about waiting. As in our call to worship, waiting on the Lord is a, is a spiritual discipline. There are also interludes in the life of our congregations, a time when after some changes perhaps, uh, changing of a pastor or whatever the case may be, times when after some changes a church needs a time out or intermission, a time when the church waits on the Lord, a time to renew strength, vision, purpose. With this current pandemic, our congregation enters an interlude in its life. Our personal lives, our corporate lives as a church, our lives as Americans, and our lives as global citizens is in a state of flux. Everything has changed. Life as we knew it is no longer. We have absolutely no idea how this will all turn out. You know, I hear people talking about when this is over and we go back to our normal lives. I have a tendency to, to say it too, but really think about it. Will we go back to living as we did? Man, I doubt it. There will be a new normal, um, a new reality. Sort of like how people view 9-11. There is a pre-9-11 and a post-9-11 reality. I'm afraid a return to normal is not to be. And as a pastor, I, I wish, I wish I knew how God is using this moment. But let's be sure, God is present in this interlude. I see positive things happening. How the healthcare workers have stepped up has been incredible. And God bless all who work in the healthcare system. God bless you. During this lockdown, I see families drawing closer. <laughs> of course, with, with some exceptions. I see families walking together, biking together, eating together, working together. It has challenged us to be more intentional about being family. I see how people have come together working for a common cause. How we see the integration between the truck driver and, and the grocery worker and, and, the, uh, and the pork production plant out in Iowa or South Dakota. On an international level, I see a general recognition, recognition of our common humanity and our common plight. I believe it potentially could bring us together. When it comes to church, I see positives. The one of the positives is that through our online services, we have reached more people than if we would have just met in our sanctuary. I share a couple examples. I have a sister who is a non-church goer, love her dearly. She texted me saying that she watched the Palm Sunday service. She said it was nice because she dislikes going to church. Online, she was able to watch it without dressing, without putting on makeup, etc. She watched it in her jammies with a cup of coffee. I have a friend who, who I've known forever, also a non-church goer, who also not only watched a service of ours, but shared it on his own Facebook page. He texted me on the Saturday before Easter to ask whether I'd be posting another service. Our church's witness, no, not service, 
but witness. Our church's witness has extended beyond the walls of our physical church. The average viewing on all four of our online services is far greater than our average weekly worship attendance. That's a good thing. There has been a gradual shift in this direction even before the coronavirus pandemic. Research reveals evidence of what the Barna Group calls worship shifting. The tendency to rely more on digital spiritual tools such as podcasts, streamed sermons, etc., instead of attending a church service at a set time and in person. And of course, this shift has only increased and magnified in response to this pandemic and, and the call to, to social distancing. Of course, there is a negative side to all of this, and, and uh, most churches have seen a decrease in giving. As with our congregation, we were not set up to handle online giving, and like others, we have now seen a marked reduction in it. But the biggest negativity I see is the absence of our weekly face-to-face -face contact in our corporate worship and social gathering. The spiritual and emotional energies one experiences when unified voices lift up in praise, in song, and in prayer. I mean, it is hard to feel the love online. I miss the intimacy of our weekly physical gatherings. And I, and I can't wait to come back together again. But when the restrictions lessen, will we be back to normal? Or will we continue proper social distancing? Will we be reluctant to shake a hand or give a hug? Will we be reluctant to share in communion, fellowship meals, or the laying on of hands and anointing services? Will we continue to wear masks when we come together in our worship service? Like you, I, I don't have the answers to this. What I am convinced of is that rather than looking only at the negative aspects of this interlude in our lives, we should try to discern where God is moving, how God is using this time for his good purposes. One of my favorite Bible studies speaks of this. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 and 12. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. So during this interlude, we wait upon the Lord. Now, waiting means different things at different times. Waiting for the Lord sometimes means staring out the window, a time of reflection and inspiration. It sometimes means spending more time in prayer than usual, more time in reading God's word. Waiting, we seek a vision from God. But let's also be clear that waiting is not idleness. Going back to our passage today, we find the disciples staring up into the sky. But we also find them actively engaged in ministry. Waiting on the Lord then has two meanings. The first, waiting for inspiration through prayer, reading God's word and being sensitive to the leading of the spirit. Staring out the window is, uh, for inspiration fits this kind of definition. Number two, secondly, the, the, the word wait is also defined as serving, like the term waiter who waits on tables. Writing this sermon, whether I'm inspired or not, fits that description. So we will continue to be the church. We not only wait on the Lord for inspiration and direction, we will continue to minister as we are able. How will the church emerge from this interlude? 
I don't know. There may be less focus on church as a building or a place and more focus on church as a people. There may emerge more efficiency in, in time, funds, and maybe facilities. There may emerge uh, smaller groups of people meeting in homes or, or other places with an occasional gathering in a larger group. The power to witness and serve may change from the outreach programs of the church to individual church members. The old way of doing church is going to change, much to the chagrin of old schoolers like me. A new church will emerge. And so like the disciples in our passage today who stand in the interlude between Jesus' departure and the arrival of the Holy Spirit, we wait upon the Lord. Psalm 27, wait for the Lord, be strong, take heart. Isaiah 40, verse 31, for those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's all right. It's all right to spend some time staring out the window. It may just be, during this interlude, a most productive enterprise. Be strong. Be, cur be of courage. Be blessed. Amen. Hear these words for our closing benediction. Christ has brought us together, together in faith, together in hope, together in love. We have gathered together to be sent out again, sent out with the welcome message of God's love. We go forth together to be living testimonies of Christ's love. As we close, remember this. Remember who you are. And remember whose you are. Amen.